God be with you till we meet again By His counsels God uphold you With His sheep securely fold you God be with you till we meet again you so much what a beautiful season of song there season of song beautiful song thank you so much i'm just going to hand over to paulette okay. uh, just to think about my couple of questions. all right so good afternoon everyone mm -hmm. um we wanted to use the opportunity formally for nigel and seppi we're going to ask you to turn your cameras on yeah Where and we actually just wanted to introduce our metro's newest married couple um, Nigel, I'm going to give you an opportunity to introduce your wife to everybody. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was unexpected. <laughs> you broke into a sweat. <laughs> well, yes. So, my name is Nigel. This is my wife. It's a piece of Giovanni now. Oh, <laughs> Wonderful. We just wanted to, to introduce Metro's latest couple because we didn't have the privilege of celebrating with them due to the lockdown that's happening. But we thought it, we could not just allow them to come online and be quiet. You know, we just needed to just let them know that the Metro family is really happy. That even in the lockdown, things are still possible. And Praise one the Lord. Is, is that they were able to get married. It's an interesting story. One day they will tell you. But they got married, but then the lockdown took place. So they're in separate locations. But oh, by God's grace, yes. somebody can say amen. By God's grace, over time, ways were found and means were procured to bring them together. So we just learned that they are able to be husband and wife. And we're just grateful that Metro has its latest married couple. God bless you, Nigel. God bless you, Seppi. God bless you all. Thank all you, right. guys. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dalbert Baker. Uh, Dr. Baker, I know that you were supposed to be with us live in Metro last September. Mm -hmm. And life happened. And mm -hmm. we do hope 
that before you leave this continent, God is going to give us the ability mm -hmm. to meet together in person uh, <laughs> yeah. in Santon. Um, but until then, we thank you for your graciousness and your willingness to come online and to speak to us about the gift. But before that, I just want to just give a brief overview of those who don't know you or know you from afar. So Dr. Baker, um, PhD, is a pastor, he's an educator, he's an author, an administrator, and I think you are also a runner, right? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah, you love running, right? Author and administrator is currently the vice chancellor president of the Adventist University of Africa, based in Kenya. AUA is a general conference graduate institution of higher education for the three SDA divisions that is located in Nairobi, Kenya. He is married to Dr. Susan Baker, a physical therapist. Uh, an educator who serves as faculty director of research at AUA. The Bakers have three adult children and six grandchildren. So we're going to hand over to you. I know that your topic is the gift, and you're going to tell us about the gift that some of us may not see as a gift, but I know God has a word. So blessings as you speak to us. Thank you very much, Dr. Baker. Yes. As you go forward. Over to you. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be with you on the Sabbath uh, evening for me. And as Paulette and Errol were saying, we were planning for several times, in fact, to get together. And it seemed like every time we had it set up, something would come up, throw it off. But now it's possible. And yeah. so it's COVID-19 that made it possible for us to come together. And I thank God for uh, the opportunity. Uh, I don't thank God for COVID-19, but I thank God for the opportunity. Yeah. And probably like you, uh, the entire continent as well as the global community is dealing with the realities of this coronavirus strand called COVID-19. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it. And so I, I, didn't, I decided not to go in the direction of another message on coping with uh, COVID-19 per se. I'm sure in the last seven or eight weeks, uh, you have received a lot of that. <laughs> but instead, this evening, I will approach it from the standpoint of how can we maximize this opportunity for the good? We know about that concept that when something negative happens, you take it and you turn it into something positive. Mm -hmm. So actually, here at AUA, that is the situation. We obviously are dealing with the realities and the impact of COVID-19, but we're seeking to use it to a good end, and, and you'll see that in just a moment. But I'd like you to do me a favor, Errol and Paulette. I'd like you to tell me a little bit about your congregation. <laughs> I did go online, I saw a little bit about it, but maybe you can tell me maybe just a word or two about the origin, uh, maybe the type of persons are in your church, your age group, something, some demographic about them, so yeah. I will get a free roll even when I'm speaking. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Baker, um, Metro Mission is a, a vibrant young church, probably about 90% millennials. Um, so that's the audience you're speaking to. Uh, high degrees of professionality in what they do. Um, Metro Mission um, started off in 2015, uh, where we were, uh, we had a mission to the city. So one of our, our big drivers was that we wanted to um, bring the gospel into the city and uh, make it very, very relevant. So what we're looking at is a church that is very creative. And in their creativity, uh, their desire is to find ways to connect people to God, grow people in uh, small groups, and, and prepare people for the service of God. And so we have uh, a very, very critical component of our work that is how do we find better practices and better ways to make the gospel relevant uh, to those in whom uh, uh, reflect our demography and our community i hope that helps you just to give you a very quick oversight and we've been around only for five years um, we started with a family of eight and it has grown to some over 120 members, but we tend to have, uh, when we had church, we had probably over 300 
people every Sabbath, a lot of people coming in from the city. Tell me something about your pastoral team and the uh, leadership in the church. Okay, so the leadership are all millennials, with the exception of myself and the pastor. Um, so basically we have uh, myself as the head elder, uh, we have Romain as uh, our, our other elder, we have our pastor, uh, Pastor Howard Rousseau, and then we have a leadership team, uh, and that leadership team looks at hospitality, we look at fundamental, which would typically be men's ministries, we've got Empower Her, which is about typically for women, um, uh, so we've changed the typical names that you would find in the church manual, so to speak, and uh, or sort of democratized them and made them more relevant for a community orientation. So we have typically about, what, 10, 15, about 15, 15 members that make up our leadership team. But as I've said, all millennials, with the exception of myself and Pastor Howard, who are, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm heading very quickly towards the 60 mark, five years to go there, and I won't speak for Pastor Howard. I'm sure he's here and would speak for himself. <laughs> pastor, are you going to say anything? Yeah, let, let me hear the pastor say something. I think he's on. Yes, yeah. he's yeah. on. Pastor Howard? Yes, I am on. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, doctor. yes, Pastor. Doctor, uh, hello doctor. there. Hello there. Good I'm, to see you. Hi. I'm a 1957 model. <laughs> uh, so, a good background on who I'm speaking to. And now maybe I'll say that you said there's two or three of you who are you know, over the 60 mark, well then that'll make four of us counting myself. <laughs> so I, will I will join with you. So now we won't say anything about our wives. My wife is right here, her name is Susan. And uh, so I won't say anything about her like you're not saying anything about your wife, Errol, but uh, at any rate, at least the four of us can be over 60, we're okay with that. So that's great. Well, that's good. It gives me a little feel for who I'm speaking to. And I, I just um, think it's a providential opportunity that God has allowed us to uh, come together. The last thing I'd like to hear, to just to ask before I begin, I'm going to ask if just maybe one or two of the people in the audience, your church members who are online with us right now via Zoom, if they would just come on and say hello to me and maybe tell me a word or two about themselves. Let's say maybe get... Uh, a guy, a man, and a female, a male and a female. Just, just to say hello, tell me their name, maybe tell me what they do, anything. Just so I get a chance to uh, see a couple people. I think you're on mute, uh, Errol. Unmute, there you go. Yeah, so if everybody can just put their cameras up uh, so that, you know, Dr. Bacon, Anyone can just share, please. Yeah, that's good. Just, that, yeah. That's fine. So he anyway, very informal. No, no, yeah. no scripted speech. It's good. Okay. So I don't mind going. Okay. So afternoon, everybody. Um, afternoon, Dr. Baker. My name is yes. Tibelise, and I look after the music ministry at Metro Mission. Um, Metro has been such a blessing to myself and my young family. And we're grateful to God for the work that Metro does, you know, within our communities and the relevance um, that Metro, mm -hmm. Metro has. And so it's been a blessing to worship at Metro. And outside of that, um, in my professional career, I'm in the financial services industry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Nice meeting you. Very well. Very much so. Okay. So let me hear one, one guy. Okay, so one of the guys. Okay, they're not normally this quiet. Here we no, here, here we they're not here. normally this quiet at all. Maybe I'll pick on somebody, Cebu. Cebu there. Hi. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can. Hi, uh, oh, it's a bit dark. I'm sitting on my couch. Let me go to, a, let me go to the light. Uh, hi, Pastor and everyone. My name is Sbu um, Simango, and I have been with Metro since uh, 2017. And uh, yeah, Metro, the Metro family has been a huge blessing to me. Um, 
between 2017 and now, there's a year that I was away for studies overseas and um, the Metro family was still very much a part of my life, even while I was studying overseas. And I'm back now, um, yeah, just uh, getting, getting to work with the Metro family, um, seeing how we empower one another as young people, um, how we empower, uh, how we not only enrich, but, but outreach as well by, by mm -hmm. sharing um, this iconoclastic approach to, to ministry with, with the community around us. Uh, you mentioned quite a few times, and I heard you mention the community and the, that the church metro is very much involved in the community. What, what are one of your ministries outreach uh, to the community? So we have a ministry which obviously is very difficult to run at the moment, uh, but uh, we, I think there are plans underway to try and get it out where we basically uh, get vouchers uh, for a supermarket uh, okay. to the value of 10 20 30 dollars whatever that would be in in, in your currency mm -hmm. but just enough for somebody to buy a small basket of goods and we basically go out to the supermarkets and give those vouchers out to to people who may be in need people who if you see, you see someone at the till um stressed out trying to pay for their goods and they have no idea how they're going to um fill or pay for their basket of goods and um no strings attached Basically, we, we, we share those vouchers and that in itself becomes a form of ministry because we aren't just here to Bible bash and push um, um, Jesus' name down people's throats. But maybe what people need to see is the character of Jesus in the acts mm -hmm. that, we, um, that we deploy towards them as opposed to us telling them about him. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. And nice meeting you as well. Uh, thank you. Likewise, Pastor. Sense. Wonderful. That gives me a real sense of the church I'm dealing with. I, I sense you're very much involved in wanting to make a difference in whichever way God directs you. And I, I think my comments then will fit very well into, uh, into your ministry and your outreach. You know, I prayed about this. It's uh, when you've never been to a congregation and you are speaking to them, it's always my desire to speak from a point of relevance uh, that we're talking, we're connecting uh, synergistically in terms of what we want to talk about. So from what I've heard, I, I believe that God will speak to us for the few moments we uh, spend together. So with that, I'd like to say a word. I would be remiss as Vice Chancellor if I didn't say something about AUA. So I, I just put together a few slides to give you a sense of what we are doing as a university and how we are serving the three African divisions. Uh, so it's SID, ECD, and WAD. The school was started in uh, 2006, and the purpose was to simply provide graduate education and the ministerial and theological training. And then we have a graduate school uh, dealing with public health, uh, master's of business administration, leadership, and applied computer science complementing the seminary. The seminary is the major part, and that's why the General Conference established it. So we don't have three different semi uh, seminaries on the, on the continent. We have one, and that's AUA. So we literally go to the three divisions, and we have instructional locations or sites there, like we have it at Babcock or uh, Seleucy, or we have it at Heldeberg, uh, we've got it at Rizangu, different places around. And so our faculty and their faculty merge together and provide the theological education. Uh, it's working well. And with this being uh, 2020, uh, we've been in existence 14 years, and God has significantly blessed us. So with that said, I just want to show you just a couple uh, slides there so you can kind of see what we're doing. And that's our title, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So we'll bring you greetings from uh, AUA. And like you, we are very much involved in the a coronavirus COVID-19 strand. I mean, that's just a reality we all have faced it. And I think I heard you, uh, Paulette, speak about eight weeks, I think it was, or maybe I read on your site or something. Uh, we're right about the same time. We actually uh, declared uh, the students would go home as of March 17. And since that time, they went home that week. And the following week, uh, we were fortunately able to go online with all of our classes. This is one of those Joseph principle situations where about three years ago, 
shortly after we arrived in 2015, the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, one of the first things we did was to put the fiber optics in the ground to rework the entire uh, internet fiber optic systems on our campus. And little did we know how fortuitous that would be because now we're using it full time. We got, we did fiber optics. We got, of course, you know, things like Moodle. That's our instructional platform. And then of course we got involved in Zoom and Polycom and other equipment pieces that we acquired. And that put us in the place where we could do online education. But when it happened in 17, uh, the students left that first week. And so the next week we're able to go full fledged all the courses online. And so that has been a tremendous blessing. I, I say that to say that whatever progressive ideas you can put into practice now, preparing for the future, uh, the better off you will be. Because oftentimes we do these things at the moment and we say, well, we probably won't use it. If we do, maybe it's superfluous. But it's amazing how little acts like that can prepare you uh, for things coming up in the future. And so it's working. We praise God for that. Uh, as I said, we're nine sites across the continent. That's a picture of our, our, one of the buildings in our school. She, uh, developing leaders, shaping leaders is our motto. And that's our uh, welcome sign entrance there on our campus. That's, this is a beautiful piece. We just did this a couple of years ago. It's Elijah passing on the mantle of leadership to Elisha. We call it the Leadership Legacy Monument, and that's in the center of our campus. And it's showing how leadership, whatever the capacity, is a part of our mandate and part of God's purpose for us. Uh, that's our library, uh, our main learning center where the seminary is, or the School of Postgraduate Studies. That's where my wife works uh, there in the area of public health. And she's also faculty development research director. Uh, this is the new building we just put up. This was dedicated on November on November 3. And so we're extremely proud of this multi-purpose complex. It's quite a complex. I won't go through all the points other than to say it's got classrooms, auditorium, a banking services, a health clinic, an amphitheater, uh, you name it. And our auditorium can seat 1,200 people. That's the side view of it there and there, there. And that's again a picture from uh, the side. So we, we have a lot going on. If you're ever interested in coming for theological education or graduate school, in the areas I mentioned, let us know, and uh, we think you'll have a wonderful experience, especially now that we can do things online. Like you can get a public health online a degree and master's, or uh, if there was something in ministry you wanted, like maybe pastoral theology, uh, these are things that we're going fully online uh, at this point in time. So remember uh, AUA. With that said, I just want to direct our attention now to the gift what we have, what we developed, and what we may offer to others, the gift. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, please. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity for this rendezvous for us to come together and to share. We thank you for the moment. And we know that as we share, your spirit will illuminate our minds and our hearts, and you will apply the word to our own lives. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the gift. I want to play off this gift factor on COVID-19. What, what could be a gift for COVID-19? Uh, there are so many different topics out there that challenge us. I mean, we talk about, you know, what is COVID-19? Why did it happen? Uh, is there a connection between this and prophecy? What does it say about the last days? Then there are other topics that talk about coping strategies and how do we deal with COVID-19? Because for some people, it, it's a big blow. And, and for many Christians who have been long in the faith or not so long, the challenge is, can my faith uh, deal with this, this, this experience, virus? Or am I seized with fear? Am I plagued with, what if it happens to me? And, and the thoughts of illness or the thoughts, God forbid, of death, often paralyze people and they find themselves really not able to cope because uh, they're just afraid. I mean, uh, what would I do or what would my family do or how would we make it? And these are real concerns. There's no question about it. And I'm sure your pastor and guest speakers and you've heard so much information on how to prepare for it. I mean, we talk about social distancing. We talk about shelter in place isolation in place, and boy, do we know about that. 
And right here on the AUA, we're actually on a compound called Avon Hill. And so we're here with the East Central African Division Headquarters. We're here with Adra Africa. We're here with Maxwell Academy, with Avon Hill Primary School. Maranatha has a site here as well. So all of these entities are here, but we're shelter in place. We're not moving around. We're not interacting on a regular basis. Yeah, we see each other. We go to the offices or whatever, but it's not like we're having regular meetings. All of our administrative meetings, all of our faculty meetings, our school meetings are done via Zoom. So we spend a lot of time in Zoom. I just got through teaching a class in the spirit of prophecy for the last two weeks. And every day for about three or four hours, uh, we would be with Zoom. And in my case, I had about 30 students from ECD, uh, some from SID, and then WAD. And so we met literally from around, from across the continent, and we talked about the spirit of prophecy and the life uh, writings and works of Ellen White. It's quite, a, quite an experience, but that's how we're dealing with it. So that, that's COVID-19. It has literally changed our lifestyle around and caused us to do things differently. But it's working. How is it working? Why is it working? Because we're taking a proactive view toward it. Instead of sitting back and allowing this thing to overwhelm us, we've taken a proactive position and we meet once a week without fail, all the leaders on the Avon Hill, we come together, we review what the government's saying, what the, what's happening in the global community, and then we're saying, how do we deal with this in our context? We have probably, I'd say more than 50% of our working staff no longer comes to Avon Hill. They're living in Nairobi, they can't travel freely back and forth, so uh, we basically are in that hibernation mode. That is everything except the teachers. As I said, all the classes are ongoing. So that's what COVID has done. It has changed our lifestyle. It has caused us to think differently about it. Uh, my wife and I were just having fun not too long ago uh, coming up with a number of different ways. Uh, for the fun of it, I'll just give you a couple of the words we're uh, coming up with on how to deal with COVID. Uh, we call it COVIDious. COVIDious, we're saying that's when a person takes the strategies of COVID 19 and they use them in a negative way. There's another COVIDing, COVIDing. That means dealing with COVID 19 on a regular basis. We've got COVIDology, COVIDology, the study of COVID. How do we cope uh, in this environment? Those are just a few, but having fun with it. So we're coming to grips with the concept of COVID 19 and, and how it works, how it's working its way into our lives. But probably the most helpful thing to me philosophically and spiritually is I have come to grips with the issue of, so what if COVID affects me? I'm over 60, as I said earlier, so they say I'm in the risk category uh, by just my chronology alone. But early on in this crisis and even before the crisis came, I, I had to deal with the reality of, you know, what would happen if I in fact did contract the virus. And probably my greatest concern with what would happen to my wife if it happened to me alone, my concern would be with her and my family, my three sons, and as you heard, our six grandkids. These are realities. But I think my core, my core anchor and my spiritual, I guess, pillar is, is my faith and confidence in providence, that P word. And the P word to me is most important. Uh, it's crucial in my life, and it's providence. God's, God's guidance that takes whatever happens to me, whatever affects me in my life and my family, I know it's within the permissive will of God or his guidance, and I can handle it. So if it's sickness, and even though the medical facilities are a good distance away from where we are here at Evan Hill, uh, I don't fear that. I mean, I, I don't want it. My wife, of course, is a physical therapist, so she could help if something were to happen to us. We'd have the basic care. But it's not like I fear it. I don't fear death. Uh, if death were to happen, I would accept that in the providence of God. So I think with that reality, I'm better able to deal with the concept. So once you go to that far end, that out end, the other things you better deal with them. Everything is simply a challenge that must be handled, faced, and dealt with. 
And that's where I am on that. So there's a lot of advice about COVID-19, but that's not where I'm going this, this evening. I'm going to, what is the gift for COVID-19? What, what is the gifting aspect that you and I can, can deal with? The gifting aspect. And, and, I, and I think a lot about gifting because, you know, in all these projects we've done here, especially with this more than $4 million uh, multi-purpose complex that just went up and it's totally debt-free. We owe no debt on it whatsoever. We praise God for that because people made a gift. People gave to the project. They gave to help scholarships. So now we have a half a million dollars in scholarship programs for AUA they will be here for perpetuity because someone gave a gift. They gave money to establish to help students here in Africa. So I guess the gifting concept is on my mind. And I said, what can, rather than saying, protecting ourselves and always simply asking that I want this Lord and I want that and protect this and protect that, what can I give to the COVID-19 situation? And that's what I'm dealing with. So I want to suggest to you the concept that the gift is the gift of goodness. That's it. That, that is the gift. What you can give to COVID-19 will be your goodness that you invest in the lives of people around you, your family, then your larger group of associates, and in this case, your church fellowship, your church family, uh, as well as your community, and with that giftedness, you use creativity. And I think that's what we'll see here, how God can use you to be creative and giving goodness as your contribution uh, to people due to this COVID-19. And to that extent, extent then, the, you're, you're making COVID work for you versus you working for COVID. You're taking things under control because you're doing good, good you would not have done had the COVID-19 situation not come up. So that's the gift, and that's what it is. Look at this right here. Ellen White makes this statement, Ministry of Healing, page 470, which is a, a priceless statement. She says, talking about the power of the gift of goodness, she says, the badge of Christianity is not an outward sign, not the wearing of a cross or a crown. A lot of people have the, you know, the cross around their necks on a chain, a beautiful gold cross, whatever. She says, that's not it. But it is that which reveals the union of man with God. Now that the key word is reveal, that, that, that active verb there reveals the union of man with God. How does that happen? How do we see that we have a union with, with man or woman to God? And then she says, by the power of his grace manifested and the transformation of character, the world is to be convinced that God has sent his son as a redeemer. That's a powerful statement. So the revelation of the union between you and God, what people can see by the power of his grace, manifesting the transformation of character, uh, that's what convinces the world. So now what does that do? What does that, uni that union result in? And here's the point of the quotation. No other influence can surround the human soul such power as the influence of what? That's an unselfish life. No other influence can surround the soul with more power than the influence of an unselfish life. And now that's something. And then that last sentence that we know very well. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. So that's it. That's the COVID gift right there. That if I can be a loving, meaning loving other people, and yet lovable, meaning that people love me in return, so it's a reciprocal situation. If I can do that, that is the strongest argument. And nothing can beat that. All the, the, the methods and formulas and ideas we have on how to cope with uh, COVID-19, social distancing and washing of the hands and uh, keeping by yourself or whatever, those are helpful, and surely we all are doing that, but that's not the strongest. It's that you can love someone, and you can be loved by someone. And both of those are transactional. It's not just a um, one-sided argument. It's, it's, it's synergistic. It's like, as you love people, they love you. As they love you, you work back and forth. And that's what I'm talking about. This gift of goodness is what 
highlights that that power, that strongest argument, and it's what attracts people uh, to you. Both of your, both of the ones who gave their testimonies a minute ago, and they talked about you know, what the church means to them and how they're involved. Immediately, I picked up the idea that they're about helping other people. And I don't know them very well, but I can almost assure you uh, that they, their argument is the fact that they're loving people and people are loving them loving them in return. So that then is, that's the gift of COVID-19, the gift of goodness, okay? Now, here's my point. In order for this to be central and to be pivotal in the gospel, this goodness must of necessity be connected, be connected with love. This love is the essence of what we're about as Christians. And more than any other time, the concept of love should be shown in the COVID-19 uh, environment. Loving in spite of fear, in spite of distance, in spite of the inconvenience. Uh, I, I love this text in Colossians 1.9 uh, that says, may we be filled with the, with the wisdom uh, and the understanding of God's word and his will. So we have a phrase around here. In fact, I've been, every week I send out a different letter to our employees. And it, the, the phrase is filled, not frustrated, filled, not frustrated. In other words, we're not so frustrated by COVID-19 that we're you know, paralyzed or immobilized or we can't do anything. No, no, we, we're just using this as a time to be filled with the love of God and his goodness. So that's, that's what I'm saying here. Goodness and love are related. There's a relationship. And in the spirit of this, I, I just wanna show you um, something from the spirit of prophecy in Ellen White's writings, I'll just go through these real quickly and you'll get the point, to show you how central love and goodness is, was, is in her writings. The concept of love is central in the Bible and it's central in the writings of Ellen G. White. And here are a few examples of how this love factor uh, is so central and you'll see how she uses this theme uh, in all of her writings, uh, in spite of the fact that she had a variety of uses, but there are seven. I'll show you the seven themes for the fun of it here, just so you'll see it, and we'll see how it ties in with that. Uh, first, first Corinthians 13 says, love is patient, kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast. It's not proud, it's not rude, not self-seeking, not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil, rejoices with truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, never fails. Now that is good. There is something about that that is purest. I mean, this, that whole list there, are just if you could be like that, or if you knew someone like that, uh, it would be a wonderful relationship. I, I'm sure you see that. Because that's what love is, that's what goodness is, and that's why we can say that they're related. So goodness and love are in the same family, and they are, they're bound together in 1 Corinthians 13. And we see that. So let's see how it's in the writings of Ellen White. I have before you just a quick uh, view of, uh, as you know, she had about 50 books in her life that came out during her lifetime of 70 years of ministry. But beyond that now, we have about more than 200 books uh, that right now are online. And I hope uh, you, you have the Spirit of Prophecy Library on your cell phone like I have in mine. I have on my computer, I have on my, my phone, whatever. You can get all of her writings there about or oh, maybe 15 years ago, um, a, a laser surgeon, an eye doctor in the Midwest in the United States gave about a million dollars to the LNG White Estate, located there at the General Conference. And his, his wish was that they put all of the writings online. And so they did it. So you can get everything online free, all of Ellen White's writings on your phone, or you can go to the ellenwhite.org and you'll get, you'll see the White Estate and you'll see all of her writings there. But in her writings, there are seven themes, no eight themes that, that are, are major. The love of God, the great controversy between Christ and Satan, Jesus, the cross and salvation, the centrality of the word of God, Bible. Number five, the second coming of Jesus. Number six, third angel's messages and the Adventist mission, which are tied together there, third angel's message and the Adventist mission. Number seven, practical Christianity and character development. And then eight, social justice. 
fact that she looked out for those who are oppressed. Uh, the, the black people in the South after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865, Ellen White was foremost in promoting the, uh, the education, the development, and the evangelization of people of color with the Seventh Adventist Church. You know, her son, Edson White, went to the South, and there he worked for some close to 10 years just developing uh, people of color there. Uh, she worked for women. Uh, she was very much about the betterment of women, children. Clearly, you know, she was about health, people who were ill or physically challenged, uh, very much about that. So that social justice idea was very strong. But for our purposes today, I just want to focus on number one, uh, the love of God. The love of God is so powerful. And I'll show you these real quickly, uh, tying in with the whole get goodness, the gift. First of all, we see the love of God is the central and most comprehensive theme of all of her writings. It's the number one, the love of God and love of each other. So goodness and love was key. She knew that was a power, and she did that. She practiced in her life through her hospitality, through helping, uh, giving, literally giving money to other people. So she mentions that theme in her book. And, and the most popular text, get this, the most popular text that Ellen White referred to in all of her writings in more than 100,000 pages of, of writing uh, was the text in Matthew that says, we should be the light of the world in Matthew. More than 260 times, she kept saying we should be the light, the light, the light, the light. And so how are you the light? You're the light by showing love and by dealing with the concept of goodness. The love of God. The God is love appears in the first three words of Patriarchs and Prophets. That's the first one of the Conflict Creator series. And then the last three words of the Great Controversy says the love of God. Uh, in her writings, God's love is central point between the struggle of good and evil. It's the phrase that provides the context for the great controversy story. First chapter in Steps to Christ, the most translated book in the world, more than 150 million copies in existence, and it's translated into more languages than any other book uh, on record. And in that first chapter of Steps to Christ begins with the words, nature and revelation alike testify of God's love, God's goodness. Steps to Christ says, the world, though fallen, is not all sorrow and misery in nature itself, or messages of hope and comfort. There are flowers upon the thistles, and the thorns are covered with what? Roses. God is love is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass. Yet she points out that even though God's love is shown in nature, but it's imperfect because of sin. So it imperfectly represents his love. He says the supreme and clearest illustration of God's love for us is God sending Jesus to save us from our sins. He's the ultimate good Savior who sets the example for giving his life uh, for us. And Philippians talks a lot about that in three chapters 3 and 4, how he lowered himself to be our, our sacrifice and died on the cross. In the first chapter of the Desire of Ages, she points out that Jesus came to reveal the light of God's love. And then she says, both the redeemed and unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. It is in light of, from Calvary, it can be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, that the love which seeketh not her own has a source in the heart of God. And in the meek and lowly one, Jesus, is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. On the last page of Desire of Ages, get this, her conclusion is that through Christ, love has conquered. And, and I don't know how, how it happened this way, how that it was so central, love was the main theme throughout, but it's a beautiful testimony that I think we all can, can relate to. And this is my favorite quotation, one of my favorite quotations of all time. This is the last chapter of the Great, Con Great Controversy in the last paragraph. And I know you know this very well. The Great Controversy has ended sin and sinner, sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats to the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love.
I, I, if I was in your church right now and I was in the front, I'd say, can somebody say amen? Maybe you can say amen among yourselves. So I, I think you're convinced. I think I made the case that love is central uh, in the government and the economy of God. And Ellen White talks about the love of the, of the divine trinity uh, in, these, in these quotations. And I think you've seen the point, goodness is crucial. So uh, the last section I want to do before ending our comments here this evening, I, I want to lock down the case for goodness. And I want to make the case for you, for you at Metro Mission, to take it to the next level in doing goodness or showing the love of God. And, I, and I'm going to trust that uh, as I hit these Bible characters and show how they make the case uh, briefly and, and the ones I have here, I, I believe that when the case is made, you'll find creative ways to make it happen because you are the means through which God wants to send his love to your community, beginning with your home, first of all, your home and those who are around you and then your church community and then beyond that. So the gift of goodness is this. So here are the compelling cases. I want to look at Solomon. Here are the ones right here real quick. I want to show you these right here, just show you a text from each life and show you how they're saying we want to, how to show the gift of goodness. Let's do it first. Solomon starts off by saying, he says that goodness is satisfying. That if we can be good and we give the gift to others, he says, you will be satisfied. I know that there is nothing better for them, talking about humans, than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. A simple statement from the most brilliant man the world has ever seen. Just do good, he says, by doing good to something therapeutic. You know, I talked about donations here at AUA. Uh, one of the things that helped my wife and me when we asked donors for funds is that we believe, pastor and to the elder and to all the members there, that by people doing good, as you bless others, so you are blessed in return. That's what Solomon says. There's nothing better. The very best thing you can do is to do good for others. And I think that's classic. So he says goodness is satisfying. Micah says this. Micah says that goodness is diverse, meaning that when you talk about love and goodness, it comes in all kinds of different varieties and forms. Uh, in Micah 1, 2, he says, hear all peoples, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. And what's the point that he says when he says that diverse? And here it is right here. What does the Lord require of you? How is goodness diverse? First of all, we see it is just to do just, to be fair, to be basic. So it's not only doing deeds, but it's how we treat people justly, to love mercy, meaning that when we have it in our power to consume or devastate somebody, we show goodness by showing them mercy, not giving them what they deserve or what, is, what they should get. So we do that. And to walk humbly with your God, meaning we do it with a sense of, of self-abnegation. Ellen White likes to use that word or self-denial or not putting yourself up there, but putting yourself down so that's really what that's really what Mike is saying. Goodness is diverse. It's got three parts to it. It's just, it's merciful, it's humble. So that way you see the, the variety there is not simply doing a good deed. It's multifaceted. Then the wise men, I, I love this one. This is a great piece. You normally know, we talk about the wise men uh, on Christmas, but I think they have so much to tell us, uh, even on our daily life throughout the year. And they tell us that goodness is, what's the word? Effortful. I used to be in the field of diversity. I worked at Loma Linda for four years, and I was in charge of the diversity program there. And the job was to get people from around the world, different diverse groups, uh, to come to Loma Linda University and to have a pleasant time with it there. And one of the phrases we always latched on to was that diversity is effortful. It takes effort. It's not easy. And so is goodness. For you to be good, it takes effort. And so why am I using the wise men to show you that point? Well, I'm showing them because, look at this text here in Matthew 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men did what? They came from the east to Jerusalem. That was well over a thousand miles. I mean, they went through 
treacherous territory and up hills and down valleys. And where were they going? Where were they going? They were going to find this Messiah that was prophesied. Now remember, now Rome is in charge of the whole world then, but uh, Mesopotamia, from where they probably came, there were these regent rulers who were wise people who had studied the records, and from, from Isaiah and from Micah and other places, they had discovered that a child was coming, this babe was coming, and he was to be king. And they knew about it, and uh, doubtlessly uh, many scholars and Bible students say that the wise men learned about the records of Holy Scriptures through Daniel's influence when he was in Babylon. They studied it, they, they went toward Israel, that's where it was supposed to be, and Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, from there God led them uh, to Jerusalem, and then a band of angels, literally, uh, they were over the dwelling place where Christ was, was born, incarnated. So what is the point here? It takes effort. For you to treat people who are disadvantaged, for you to give up your funds, for you to give up your time, for you to be forgiving when you don't even want to be that, it's effortful, effortful. They had to travel. They went to the king, and then after they went to Herod, the crook Herod, they didn't go back to him, but they finally found Jesus, and they gave him, you know, the gifts, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I, I, I don't want to get too to uh, typological or mystical, but I, I saw when I was putting this little talk together here, uh, I, I said, well, then they have three gifts. And so we have three gifts too. You know, we have justice, mercy, and humility. Uh, maybe like the three gifts, uh, they were bringing gifts to Jesus, literally bringing gifts, the gift of goodness. What they did was good, but what they gave him was also uh, very good. So goodness is effortful. Uh, and then number four, as we're wrapping this up, goodness is daring, daring. What did I say? Daring. Luke 10 brings that out. A certain Samaritan goes along and he finds this man by the side of the road, beaten up, uh, bleeding, clothes taken off, robbed, clearly, left there to die. And even though others pass him, this man takes his goodness and he's daring and he helps this man. You, you, you see the story there. It's a powerful story. You never can read it too much. Uh, but a certain Samaritan, not the Jews who passed by the man, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And then he did good. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now, that's good, folks. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, excuse me, take care of him and whatever more you spend and when I come again, I will repay it. That's good. That's wonderful goodness. That's what I'm talking about. So goodness is daring. Uh, Acts 11, 22, uh, you, there's Barnabas. You know, the wonderful story of Barnabas, you know, he sent this man, son of encouragement. That's says when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. that This man had good emotional intelligence. He was, he was a happy man. He was a, a collegial man. He was a compatible man. And so it's encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. He was an encourager. And then finally it ends with the sentence there, uh, the last two. And for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And then it says there, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So that's what goodness does. It, it brings people in. So goodness is contagious, and Barnabas was the one that, well, I couldn't end without putting goodness is discernible, and that's by the half-brother of Jesus, James. Uh, because, I mean, James is so practical. His book, his five chapters are just rich with just practicality, good leadership tips, uh, good interpersonal tips, tips uh, good administrative tips on how to run a church and how to run an institution. But one of the things he says in there, he says, you know, if you just say you love God and you don't, he says it along with John, and you don't show that love by practical works, he says it's dead. You know, faith without works is dead. So here it is in 14 to 7, he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he is faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him if a brother or sister is poorly clothed? They need some goodness. And lacking in daily food, they need some goodness there. And one of you says to them, go in peace, brother, we'll pray for you. 
be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body? What good is that? He's saying you have to put some goodness in this. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And so James is saying to us that good is discernible. So there you have it. There you have it there. Okay, let me just get it real quick here. Satisfying from Solomon. Micah is diverse. Wise men say it's effortful. Uh, the Good Samaritan, we see from there that goodness is daring. It's contagious. James says it's discernible. And finally, Jesus, Jesus himself, says goodness is rewardable. And I like this, rewardable. And Matthew 25 says it very well. It says, um, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father. Why? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, why is he saying this? He says, for I was hungry and you treated me good and gave me food. I was thirsty and you did good to me and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you did good to me and you took me and I was naked and you did good to me and I and clothed me. I was sick and you did good and visited me. I was in prison and you did good. You came to visit me. And so there you have it, the gift of goodness. That's what we can do through COVID-19. You can call, you can be a friend, you can text, you can email, you can send things via cyberspace or the internet. And this is only for a time, but God is calling you to give the gift of goodness. And so I'm going to um, end in just a minute and have a word of prayer, but I'm hoping that uh, before we close out this Vespers this evening, uh, that maybe two or three of you uh, can just give brief testimonies about what you think God is saying to you as far as goodness is concerned. I don't want to just leave it mono-sided or one-sided myself, but I want to hear someone say, here's yeah. what I hear God saying to me, and here's what God can say. So that those are the cases. Yep. Those are the ones there, the ones who are giving us a good word. And yep. so I want to say, like Jesus said, go and do ye likewise. No. You go do it. Show mercy and show. Is yeah. somebody saying something? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. If, if you could put the screen share down, there's some questions that have come up and some okay. comments. Okay, very good. I just want to share with All you. Right. If you just kind of um, stop, I'll just, yeah, deal with the part. Okay, there uh, you go. So that everybody can come on now and... and, and um, thank you so much, uh, you know, Doc, for that uh, really blessing there. And um, couple, there's a couple of comments that's come out, you know, around what kind of struck people around what you were saying of the different categories of goodness. Um, and, you know, one of, one of the participants said, effort strikes me the most because it shows that we must come out of our comfort zones to show love to others. Um, others say, you know, that goodness is effortless because I have to take uh, action and not just expect things to happen. Uh, another said that contagious is, uh, uh, goodness is as it spreads from source to whoever it's touched. There's a question that came out that said, um, Pastor, does goodness allow for us to call out someone who is being blatantly unfair? Or is it our job to always turn the other cheek. Uh, that's a good question. Very good question. And if if uh, there's I'm, questions, please put them down on the chat, folks. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a great question. And it's, Pastor, does goodness allow for us to call out someone who's being blatantly unfair? And, and I would say without question, without hesitation, absolutely. Now, I think when I say calling them out, I, I would wonder what you mean by saying calling them out. Now, you don't want to be negative like perhaps they have been negative. You don't want to come across in, in kind of a demeaning or antagonistic manner and put them down but you can have a righteous indignation and stand for those who are who are oppressed and who are being treated unjustly yes you can and so in that case uh you, you are not fighting your own battle and you're not like, defending yourself but you're defending someone in need so i think that is definitely something a part of the goodness i the only thing i would caution with that is just simply watch your own motive and in your promoting goodness that you don't become bad yourself by using wrong techniques to even defend somebody else. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, 
so I think that it's just watching that idea of righteous indignation. I suppose the question is, what does righteous indignation look like? Elijah seemed to have had righteous indignation uh, where he, uh, let's say, saw that Samuel was quite, um, Saul was quite disobedient uh, to the will of God and uh, demonstrated righteous indignation that had a level of violence attached to it. I mean, what do you classify as righteous indignation? Well, righteous indignation is indignation or, or let's say upsetment or kind of a sense of defensiveness when it's not unrighteous. I think the words themselves define it. I mean, when it says righteous, it's saying that you're doing it out of, out of a purest motive. You're truly for the good of the person. Uh, you're protecting someone like, for example, I mean, uh, God forbid, but if you see some parent abusing their child, I mean, you can have a righteous indignation about that. If you see some a husband or wife abusing each other, uh, be it physically or emotional, one can have a righteous indignation and want to intercede in a positive way. So, or if you see injustice happening in the church or in society. Mm -hmm. I, I think the big thing, I, I always feel with that, like the phrase that they say, uh, is this the, the hill you want to die on? And you have to choose what is the best moment to do it? What is the best way to do it? Are you the best person to do it? Sometimes uh, you may see something that's happening that's negative, and maybe someone else could be better placed to make that defense than you. So you have to kind of be smart and wise and harmless in dealing with it. But no, I, I believe righteous indignation. Look, Ellen White was indignant in protecting uh, the people of color in the South following the Civil War. In 1891, she confronted the entire General Conference and made a speech entitled Our Duty to the Colored People, in which she said to the church leadership in Battle Creek, I mean, this is basically a white church at that point in time, nothing like it is now, we're well over 60% people of color, but at that time it wasn't. And she said, listen, you brethren have waited too long. You've been going everywhere else and you haven't been working in the South. She says, if you don't go to the South, sin is waiting at your door. Mm -hmm. Now, my sisters and brothers, that was that was a confrontation. Mm -hmm. And you know the story, perhaps you've heard it, that at that same general conference session, uh, mysteriously, so this was, remember, this was after the 1888 movement, when she confronted the brethren about how they were not being receptive to the truths of righteous by faith from uh, Jones and Wagner. Well, right after that, and then after her confrontation about the people of color, they sent Ellen White to Australia. They sent her as a missionary to Australia. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she said she cried, wept tears, and she never knew, she said God had given her no word of confirmation that he wanted her to go, but because the brethren had taken that position, she chose to go to Australia. And as you know, it proved to be a wonderful, incredible blessing, wonderful yeah. blessing. My point is, she was willing to stand for the oppressed, and mm -hmm. she's willing to take a position. Mm -hmm. Knox, I think Knox wants to ask a question. Knox, would you like to just uh, share your question with Dr. Baker? Um, good evening. Um, it's not much of a question, I guess, more a comment. Um, I was struck by the, um, the point that goodness is um, courageous, right? So this week, I was struck by a phrase that says, do good recklessly. Um, oh, and I think during COVID times, um, and even before COVID, whenever we think about doing good, we think about, is it a scam? You know, um, yeah, that's true. if I give this person money, are they going to use it for drugs and alcohol instead of using it for food? You know, um, if I help this person with this thing, are they going to, you know, do something else with it? Um, and, and not to be, um, not to be blasé about it. That's not the right word. But I think there is some truth to doing good anyway, right? Doing good recklessly. And Sometimes it really does take courage to be like, I don't really know how this might end, but I am trusting in the Holy Spirit and I'm trusting in God to lead my goodness or my good efforts in this regard. So um, I was really, really touched by this message because truly do good recklessly has been ringing in my mind the whole week. Yeah, <laughs> so and, 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 and I so uh, I, I think you make a, a very good point, and, and that, that's a legitimate point. I think we all, when we're doing good, recklessly or otherwise, or even consciously, 
uh, we have to think like you're saying. I mean, it could be a scam. And so there is, I, I do believe that you have to pray and ask God to have a spirit of discernment uh, to know what to do. But my philosophy is, if it's within my power to do goodness, and if I err, I want to err on the side of doing more good than not enough good. And I think that's the point. Uh, my wife and I uh, talk all the time about uh, on a daily basis, we wake up and we say, Lord, give us a chance to do good today. Help us to find an opportunity to do good. I mean, we're here on a campus, and, and even last week, I mean, I prayed that, and God gave me a, a number of key areas, ways I could do goodness, and I did it. Now, maybe, you know, in every case, it wasn't totally deserved. I mean, I don't really know. Uh, but, you know, when I think about people who have good, done good to me, and helped me when I was growing up. And then even here at AUA, they took a risk with me. So why can't I take a risk with them? But very good point. Thank you for sharing that. No, thanks a lot, Knox. And just on the chat there, I think, uh, you know, so, so when you talked about um, uh, righteous indignation, so never in defense of one's own dignity, only the dignity of others. I think that's a, a question that came out there, um, you know, it's in, it's in the dignity of others, not one's own, seems to be the emphasis there. Uh, and that's a, that's a strong word, just, just right there, all by itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, when I mentioned earlier about Ellen White being taken up for the oppressed groups, uh, I'm just thinking of an incident that happened. Uh, one time she was in the church, and this guy was, this, this elder was up there waxing eloquent. He was just preaching, preaching, you know, quote, with power. Mm. And, and as he was preaching, uh, toward the end of his message, Ellen White interrupted him. She says, brother, you're not right with God. Mm -hmm. She says, you are not right with God. She, in fact, uh, she said, you have, she says, you have a wife here with three children hanging on to her skirt. But she says, you have a wife in another place with two children, and neither wife knows about the other. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we want to be confrontational or righteous indignation like that. I'm simply saying she was prophetic and that while that was a rare situation, things happened where she protected people and looked out for them and helped the oppressed group. At times she did directly confront the general conference president, uh, pastors, leaders, through the revelations that God had given her. Imagine she had more than 2000 visions in the course of her life. So God had given her a lot of insight. And in fact, some people didn't want to hang around on the way because they, they were afraid of what she might say about sin that was in their life, and they, in many cases, wanted to uh, to uh, protect it. I think. Thank yeah, you. I think I think um, you know Aubrey just said as a takeaway for himself. He said it puts a lot of responsibility on us. And what's the best way to intervene, especially considering how busy we are with our own lives? It requires us to really be selfless, really dwell on the problems, challenges of others before making a move. And that's kind of his takeaway that he's, he's, he's taking from uh, the message that you're sharing here for best, yeah. you know. Well, well the, the best thing I can say to that, Errol, is I call it PG. Mm -hmm. PG, prioritize goodness. Mm -hmm. now, you've got to prioritize it. You've got to leave room for it. You have to leave some money in your budget to be good. You have to leave some time in your day to be good. And, and even on Sabbath, Sabbaths are wonderful days to do good. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Yes, this is a great day to do good. So you have to think about it. And a lot of times it's not easy. I mean, like I, I just, again, thinking about some of these donors, I mean, they give these, these you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Well, why are they doing that? I mean, why? I mean, if they, especially if they've given once, why would they give again? Because they're prioritizing goodness. And, and I, I like to think that God is impressing people when to do good and how to do good. You know, I was just, I, if something happened about six months ago, I was leaving a meeting. It was a very intense meeting, a very busy meeting, about three or four hours. And so as I was leaving uh, the meeting, I saw uh, this student who happened to be a pastor. And I went over to him and I said, you know, I'm impressed to say something to you. Um, I said, I, I'm impressed to say something to you. And I asked him, I said, are you dealing with some particular need? And I said, I've just been impressed to ask you that and to see if there's a way we can work together. And the guy cried. He literally cried. He cried and he said, you know, I was just praying this evening. He said, I'm in this crunch. He said, I'm badly this. If I don't do this right here, you know, I, I can no longer continue. And we were able to, it, was a, it wasn't even a huge amount, but it was 
We're able to work it out. We're able to assist him. And, and his tears showed me in the timing. I felt impressed and he was there and we met together, had a rendezvous there and PG happened, prioritize goodness. I took the time, he was praying and so we were able to connect from that point. So uh, that may be a little dramatic, yeah. but I, I like to think that through circumstantial providence that God can lead you to somebody with just the very thing you need to answer their prayer. Isn't it be great to answer someone's prayer? And that's good. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you so much. And I think, you know, as we close out, I think that that is the core because the, the core underpinning of Metro is, is where love is experienced. That's what we say, where love is experienced. Okay. Where not, love is experienced. That come, okay. not that you come to a church to experience love, but wherever we are, the love of God should be experienced and experienced in concrete terms. And so I think the message that you're sharing with us is that prioritizing goodness or the categories of goodness are love being is love being experienced and the more we're able to connect into you know the providence of god's desire for other people and ourselves where we're making that impact then we're truly living out the philosophy of metro which is where love is experienced and i think that what has drawn many of the the young people to to Metro has been the fact that love has been experienced, but not to the degree we know that God wants it to be. It's gotta be far more than whatever we're doing. And, you know, I think you've just given us some really good food for thought as we go into this new week, that how can we prioritize goodness? I think that's the core against those, those seven categories. How can we prioritize goodness in such a way that the love of Christ is experienced in this week. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Baker, I just want to thank you. And if folks, uh, uh, you know, felt a, a move on that one, just open your cameras and put something on the chat just to express your thoughts there. As I'm going to ask, you know, um, Dr. Baker, as, as you, you just wave out I to him. Hey, hey, wave. Just that you see more than pictures, Doc. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Behind the pit. God. Um, we'd love you to just share a word and, 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 and just pray over us right now as we go into a new week. The sun is literally just about to set. You've given us food for thought, and we want to go with a, a word in season, that word in season and a prayer to prioritize goodness as we go into this new week and make that gift work. Yep. Well, praise God, I will do. I just scanned through and saw the 40 plus people online. Yep. And I thank God for each one of you and my prayers as I pray now, even though I don't know your names individually, I know that God is seeing each of your needs. So let's bow our heads together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for creating this, this meeting point, this juncture that we could come together, our lives could touch. We know that when we meet people, we're never the same again after meeting one another, and uh, thus we pray is the case now. Only this time, Lord, we ask that goodness would be the earmark. Uh, this would be the, the signal between us. This is our covenant, that we're covenanting to prioritize goodness, mm -hmm. and that we would accept this gift and to pass this gift on. Thank you so much for Errol and uh, Paulette and the pastor and his wife, the leadership team there. We thank you for every person on this call, even the ones who are not here. We, we believe that as a result of this, Lord, we're going to see a ripple effect and more goodness will accrue and happen now as a result of us making this covenant. So we seal this in our hearts. And I pray now that as we end the Sabbath off and as we face a new week, the power of the Holy Spirit would come on us in many, many creative ways that we would create new initiatives to make a difference in the world around us. Thank you for hearing and thank you for this service. We pray this in the lovely name of Jesus and for us say, amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, thank you so much, Doc. Really appreciate it. Greet God, bless. God bless you. Greetings to your lovely wife as well. Uh, do it. And do it. we do have, hope the opportunity will come that you will make it to Metro. Um, we we yes. trust that they will come. I will look forward to that. God bless. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, no. Bye-bye. Okay, folks. So just uh, just thank you so much for checking in. Um, next week, we have uh, Rome Leah.
who's going to give us a two-part series, uh, one next week and the week afterwards. Uh, his message for next week, what did, uh, must, what, what did he say to me? Uh, his, his message is um, set your mind on things above. So that's what uh, Rome will be bringing uh, to us. And I trust that you have a really good week, guys. And let's